Okay, hello. This is a continuation of my summary of my analysis on how the United States is starting a new Cold War with Russia. All right, and you might ask, ask yourself, well, why are they doing that? Well, it's because wars have been and continue to be a chief means of acquiring great amounts of wealth. Wealth, power, and... Um, uh, influence all right and I tried to show you how this is so when I made my uh, analysis of the evolution of the economics of war all right and uh, wealth from warfare uh, is generated through different means and has uh, evolved going through four different stages from classic empire building to the mercantilist era, uh, through the colonialist era, and then finally with modern industrial machine production of weapons. Now, through this uh, progressive development, there was a key change with the Industrial Revolution, which is a fundamental sea change in how things are produced. Things are produced by machines in uh, the industrial era, and that vastly increased the volume of the output. Uh, it vastly increased the productivity. Now, the Industrial Revolution was involved in the last two eras. The colonialism era, right, because it went hand in hand. Colonial expansion went hand in hand with home industries. You needed the colonies to get the raw materials to fuel and feed your industries. And also as outlet markets for your excess manufactured goods. And, of course, the Industrial Revolution... Uh, was involved in the industrial machine production of weapons and munitions. That's this era here. So what I want to do is I want to uh, elaborate and teach you more on the Industrial Revolution. And this is my analysis of the Industrial Revolution. All right, It's quite a bit of material, even though it is an overview. I cannot get into all the nitty-gritty details. It is just a basic overview, all right? But I'm going to go through the eight stages of the Industrial Revolution, which I outlined for you in a previous lecture, all right? And uh, before I do that, I want to start off by placing the Industrial Revolution in its overall historical context, all right? So that's the focus of this lecture, it's very limited, and it's this box right here. Historical context of economic evolution. Now, the core of economies is not production, it's not consumption, it's transactions, it's exchanges. Without that, you're not going to have production. Without that, you're not going to have consumption. You have to have those transactions. And you can say the first transaction economies, you know, in any significant degree, occurred in the second stages of uh, the evolution of societies. The first stage was hunter-gatherer societies, the most primitive societies. That was followed by the agrarian and pastoral societies. Right? And these two societies represented a vast improvement in the methods of producing food, which provided a surplus food. And that provided uh, opportunity for people to specialize. Not everyone had to produce food. They can specialize. Right? So they're doing something else other than food production. But they still needed to eat. So they, it required transactions or exchanges. And thus, economies grew from there. The second stage was a mercantilist uh, stage, which involved long-distance transportation and trade in high-valued, uh, non-perishable goods. This required military control of trading posts and trade routes. But it allowed for wealth concentration in the hands of merchants. And with all that extra wealth, the merchants became uh, commercial capitalists. So what they did was, the merchants said, you know, I'm buying all this nice, fine silk cloth. Well, screw that. Why should I buy? Why should I buy? I'll make it, and I'll make more money. 
So this represented a form of upstream integration in which the merchants branched out and became the producers of the fine cloth, right? And they own the rudimentary machines or tools needed to make the cloth. So they become the owners of production. They became capitalists. That's what a capitalist is. They own the capital. And the capital is the means of production, right? And they would use that. Uh, they would lease it out or lend it to artisans who would produce for them. Okay. Now, that made them even more money. With all that extra money, they became lenders of money. They became uh, bankers. And this was the development of financial capitalism. Banks in the modern sense, lending out for interest, right? And uh, uh, the key banking centers were the key commercial centers. So the merchants were in places like Florence, Genoa, Venice, right? That's, they became banking centers, right? Because, because that's where all the money was. And then when the Portuguese guy, da Gama, found the, the sea route, total sea route to uh, the spice trades in Asia, right? The Portuguese dominated commerce. And Antwerp was the center of Portuguese Spanish commerce. So that became the banking center of the world, right? Then the Dutch fought the Span in the 80 years war. And when they won, uh, 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 the, 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 the commercial and banking center shifted to Amsterdam. And then the British fought three Anglo-Dutch wars against the Netherlands. And when they won, the commercial and, and banking center shifted to London. All right. And at about the same time when this was going on, about 1600, uh, uh, the first nationally chartered uh, East Indies companies were developing, and that led to the development of nationalistic mercantilist policies. All right. So that's the next stage. And then finally you have industrial capitalism with the invention of machine production of goods, which greatly increased value added, right? But that also greatly increased need for raw materials and markets. And this led to colonial competition, which was a key factor that led to wars, All right? So I want to give you a little bit more elaboration on this, help you understand it a little better. So, again, this deals with the evolution of economies, and you could say the first economies involved agrarian or, and pastoral societies, uh, the improvements in food production with agriculture and, you know, pasturing of animals resulted in surplus food, which allowed for specialization or division of labor, which is far more productive and efficient when people specialize. All right, so that, that's that David Ricardo concept, right? Um, which then required transactions because if not everyone's involved in food production, people are specializing, making weapons, making textiles, making leather goods, whatever, right? You know, well, they still need to eat. So to do that, they got to trade for the goods that they produce for whatever, for food. Now, now, the transactions in these, uh, these economies tend to be limited in range and in product diversity. For example, they're often limited to the feudal manor system, where you have uh, a feudal lord in control of territory. There's, there's a town at the center and a few artisans in the town who produce certain goods. And trade was mostly between the rural farmers and the town artisans, right? Limited products, limited artisans, right? Limited range. Now, uh, with certain goods, you can have long distance trade. And the merchants were the ones who conducted the long distance trade. So the development of long distance trade and high value, non perishable goods because transportation was slow, right? You can't have goods that will rot on, along the way. Right, that brought great wealth to the merchants, shippers, 
Examples of goods were spices, precious metals, gems, incense, perfumes, uh, medicines, drugs, opium, silks, textiles. Dyes were big. Uh, Phoenicians uh, were, were big producers of dyes that, great, that bought them great wealth. Um, a purple dye from uh, some sh seashell animal. Tea, sugar. This required military control of trading posts and trade routes. All right. Now, these merchants became the first commercial capitalists. So certain enterprising merchants, these guys who did long-distance trade, you know, for example, the Italian traders, who traded in fine silks, conducted an upstream integration by purchasing textile machines and contracting artisans to use them to produce silk textiles from raw silk in a cottage industry setting. So they say, hey, I'll let you lease or I'll lend you this machine if you produce these silk uh, textiles for me, right? And I'll pay you out of your home. That's cottage industry. So these merchants were the early capitalists. They maintained ownership of the machines, right? They were the owners of the means of production. That's what a capitalist is. So now, this brought them greater wealth, this upstream integration. So they became super wealthy off of this. They got even more wealthy. And with all that money, they're flush with money. They said, well, hell, why don't we lend it out and make some more money? So they became the first bankers in the modern sense, lending out for interest, right? And so uh, uh, the dominant commercial centers, where these merchants were, right, they became the banking centers. Places like Florence, Genoa, Venice, uh, during the era after the Europeans captured uh, control of uh, Silk Road and spice trade, right, with the, with the Crusades, and the Italian nations dominated the Italian city-states, right? Then, when the Gama discovered the total waterborne route to Asia, which is far cheaper than going across land, right? They had the, the, the uh, price advantage. Five times cheaper going this way to get spices to Europe. Five times cheaper. They won out. They dominated commerce, which means they became flush with money. So they became the banking center. Spanish, Portuguese, Antwerp became the commercial and financial center of the world, uh, killing the Italian city-states. Then after the 80 years war, uh, when the Dutch beat uh, Spain, Portugal, all right, power shifted, commercial center shifted to Amsterdam, and that became the banking center of the world. And then when the British defeated the Dutch in three Anglo-Dutch wars, the commercial center and financial center shifted to London. And then with World War I, right, and the USA became flush with money from the highly profitable war trade with the Allies, New York became the banking center of the world. All right, shifted again. All right, so the next stage of economic evolution was the rise of nationalistic mercantilism policies which began to form around 1600 with the founding of nationally chartered companies like the British and Dutch East Indies companies, supported by national military forces, right? So these companies had to get national military support, right? It was dog-eat-dog, -dog, one nation's champion company versus another's to attain monopoly control of trade. Now, I've taught extensively on uh, mercantilist policies in a previous lesson on the historical evolution of economics, I cannot go back and teach it all again. I'm sorry. There's a lot to mercantilist policies. It's very interesting, but I can't teach it all again. Now, the, the, the modern era is the industrial capitalist era. It began with machine production in textiles, these machines here, right? 
early machines went back to the commercial capitalists, right? Uh, but really, the Industrial Revolution took off with the cotton industry, and uh, that was allowed by the cotton gin machine. We'll talk about that in the next lecture, right? So, uh, industrial capitalism began with machine production of textiles, which greatly increased value added. And keep in mind, value added is a chief money maker. You don't make much money selling, producing and selling primary products like raw grain, you know, raw cotton. You make far more money by producing and selling a finished product. Value added is where you make your money. Right? That's why the U.S. wanted to get into manufacturing in the North. Uh, it also increased production volume, which increased need for raw materials. And this required colonial expansion to get those resources and to get markets to sell your excess goods. Thusly, increased industrial production went hand-in-hand -hand with colonial expansion. So to increase your industrial production, you have to get those colonies. Right, and then this formed autarkic trading blocks between the home country and the colonies. So this was a, an enclosed, self-sufficient, self-reliant market. All right, between the home country and the colonies. Also, counties offered more profitable investment opportunities than the home country, largely due to saturation of investment opportunities in home com in home country. So it was more profitable to invest overseas in the colonies. But in all these ways, our target trading blocks became the chief means of creating national wealth at that time, which translated into military power because you make your military power from your national wealth. But the military power created international insecurity, which resulted in fierce economic nationalism and rabid colonial competition because this was a means of gaining national wealth, right? So because national wealth and military power and insecurity, international insecurity, national security issues all went together, that led to fierce uh, economic nationalism and colonial competitions that really kind of blew up in the latter part of the 19th century. It became pretty rabid, the, 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 the competition for colonies. And that was a geopolitical environment or the geopolitical milieu that led to World War I. Okay, so that was kind of significant. A kind of repeat happened between the two wars in, in a little different sense, but we'll get to that when we get to World War II. All right. So hopefully that puts the Industrial Revolution into context. The Industrial Revolution happened here in the latter part. Okay. That's that lecture.